Right. So in this chapter, we are going to talk about economic growth. In the next lecture, what we discuss is how to measure in the GDP. Okay, once we know how to measure in GDP, and then so we can keep track of the GDP. So that's going to give us one measure, which is economic growth. But besides uh, to keep track of the, the size of the economy and the economic growth, in this chapter, we are going to talk about other things, like what explain the economic growth, right? So by the way, so this is a roadmap of this chapter. Okay? So we are going to see what does this mean of long-run economic growth. And then the next, we're going to study what determines the long-run economic growth, what's behind. Right, so that's the second part, okay? What determines, or what are the keys to get them growth, okay? And then next we're gonna explain, so why the economic growth is a different, a differ among countries, right? And then, so next we're gonna talk about the convergence hypothesis, essentially, so the country is gonna catch up with each other. But is that true? So that's something we need to investigate. So we are going to close this chapter by talking about sustainability. So what is sustainability? That means whether the long-term growth is sustainable, because usually so the growth comes at the cost of environmental issue, come at the cost of exhausting our natural resource. Okay, so whether we have enough resource to sustain the growth, that's the discussion we are going to have at the end of this chapter, right? So let's start with this one. So this slide says growth has a benefit and a cost. So this is in the class, class of economics. So like I mentioned in the first day of this class, so everything comes with a cost and a benefit analysis. Now so you get some opportunity and then you lose something else. Okay? So like this picture shows, now it's your China. So this is something we frequently discuss because in the past three or four decades, so China is considering a miracle in terms of growth, right? We already saw that uh, saw that uh, in previous slides. But if we want to extrapolate what's going to happen in the in the next decade, no one knows. But it seems like it's declining, right? But anyway, so in the past three decades, so China has set the example of uh, economic growth miracle. So that's why we studied that extensively when we talk about economic growth. But for other things, for, 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 but for the rest of the other topic in macroeconomics, usually we look at US economy, right? So like this background picture shows, so China's growth was exceptional, but at, uh, but at the same time, the cost was also extraordinary. Right? One cause was the pollution, okay? Now, if we want to compare one country to the other country, or particularly, so comparing some uh, less developed country with, with United States, and then we understand what does growth means and what growth can bring us. So here we have data. So for US data, it's fairly com uh, complete. So from 1900 to 2010, Actually, this is another reason why we US, study US economy, right? So from 1900 to 2011, so on the top, that's US economy. And so we have real GDP per capita. Now, I hope you understand why we look at a real GDP, right? So, the, uh, and, and this per capita. So that's essentially, that is a good measure to measuring the standard living, like how much we produce, how much we can consume. And we keep track of these for decades. Now I want to pay attention on the vertical line. So this log, uh, this log scale. Why we use log scale? Because it's easier to see, right? Otherwise, if we move from 1,000 to 100,000, so the graph is going to be very large. And on top of that, so log, uh, log scale has another benefit. If you are familiar with calculus or algebra, and you should know for log, if we look at log, the slope of this curve essentially give you the growth rate, right? So if you don't, if you don't get that, don't worry. So this is the economic clause. So you should learn that from your uh, calculus or algebra. But, just, but just, just, just good to know, if we look at log, 
the percentage essentially is a percentage growth, right? So that's what we use log. All right, so for the US economy, what we immediately observe is overall, so there's growth, or in other words, this graph, this curve is positive. Certainly, so we have some downturns, okay? So this is something we studied in previous class, which was Great Depression, right? Okay, Great, Great Depression. And then so the World War II, so it's kind of boosted the domestic economy, right? So you may wonder why a war brings economic growth. What is your guess? Why a war brings a boom in domestic economy? So remember, remember last class we talked about expenditure, right? C plus I plus G plus N net. So essentially, so the temporarily, so the war just increase the government spending because the government, government what needs a lot of military equipment. So temporarily increase the expense, right? So that's the reason. All right, so this is for the United States. Now we look at two other countries. Start with India. Okay, so Indians, for some reason, they have a very complete data. So largely thanks to the British colonization, right? So British, so there was ruled the country since uh, 1800. And then, so they have very complete, or they just borrow, or they just bring, they brought their expertise to India. So that's why they have also have complete data. Uh, two things you notice. Number one, so the gap is large and is consistently large. But certainly, so this gap starts narrowing during the past decades. I have a series, it's very large. Okay. So this is uh, this regarding to uh, India. So now we bring China into the table. Okay. And China, so they have very uh, poor data. So particularly, before 1900, uh, 1930, okay, before 1930, so data is pretty much missing. And then, so between this time period, data is also missing, okay, certainly because of the war. So here, this is civil war, and there's another civil war, right? And then, so if we look at China, so what was remarkable is what happened since 1980. Okay, that was very, very remarkable. And remember this log, this log scale. Okay? And then you can see, so the growth rate, so because the slope of this curve is very high, it certainly is higher than US and higher than India. And that immediately implies, so they just catch up very quickly, right? So the gap is very large, now it's narrowing. So if we keep plotting, so it's getting narrower. But seriously, significant, significant. But anyway, so this is playing a catch up, right? So the takeaway from this graph is that a poor country, so in terms of standard of living can be significant or substantially lower compared to the United States. But once they play a catch up, so something can be remarkable. But this also tells us if one country, a mature country like the United States, if we manage to keep moving forward for a century, so that's also, it's gonna be remarkable, right? Look at here, what we were able to produce and what we able to consume per capita term. And now compared to what are we able to do today, right? For centuries, tenfold increase, right? So this is, <clears throat> this is the first flavor of economic growth. Now let's look at these practice questions so that we understand what is the correct way to look at growth. Okay, look at this practice question. So here we look at a fictional economy. Okay, so I just name it as Macronesia. So we knew their real GDP, apparently this total GDP, right? In 2010, is 200 million, 
right? Now, what happens between 2010 and 2011 is that the population increased from 100,000 to 105,000. Simultaneously, GDP increased by 5%. Now, this question asks you, what happened to real GDP per capita? So how we calculate real GDP per capita? Essentially, we use the total GDP divided by the population. Right before you rush to do the calculation, but you inspect these questions, see what happened. So basically what happens is, let me first write down this equation, okay? So real GDP divided by population. But, but before you rush to do that, let's just inspect. So this question or told you real GDP grow by 5%. Now let's see what happened to population. So population also grow by 5%, right? So, and then so unfortunately, these two is going to offset each other, right? Or in other words, the population growth is gonna dilute the economic growth. Does that make sense? And then in the net term or in the per capita term, nothing changed, right? So the answer is C. But then from this exercise, so you should learn. So what matters is what? Is in per capita term. If we only look at the total size, it can be misleading, right? Because what matters to us is, so on each person on average, what, how much you can produce, how much you can consume. But certainly, so once you go to more advanced class and then you realize, so per capita real GDP is also very limited information because it doesn't tell us, so there's someone super rich and someone super poor, right? But this is the beginning, right? Now here we can look at uh, US economy to appreciate the importance of economic growth. Okay. So what are we gonna do? So again, so essentially we just uh, use a number to represent the graph we just saw. So this literally coming from the graph we saw. In 1900, in 1900, okay? So for the United States, the United States. So if we just normalize the real GDP per capita in 1900 as 100%, and then we can calculate, so in 2010, the real GDP per capita can be 758. Or reversely, we can use 2010 as 100, normalized. And then reversely, we calculate, so what happened in 1900? So in either way, the same sense. What this tells us is due to the economic growth. So there was substantial improvement from 1900 to 2010. So one way to say that is, so 2010, so on average, a typical American can, can consume or can enjoy eight times more compared to someone who was living in 1900. Or alternatively, we can say, okay, in 1900, so people only have a 13% of what we can enjoy today. But keep in mind, so this doesn't factor in, let me write down, it doesn't factor in quality. That right, quality of goods. And it doesn't factor in variety. Right? Like we saw lots of clause. So in 1900, many things did not exist. Even 1950, many things did not exist. Right? But anyway, all of those things coming from economic growth. Okay. Now, if we look at the growth or look at economic performance, across country. So this is how it looks like, okay? It's very different. So how we understand this picture? This is a word map. If you look at the, the legend, so high income with a darker color. Oh, by the way, here, high income is defined as per capita GDP is more than 12,000. So remember United States, right now we are between 60 to 70. It's very high. 
but not highest. Okay, there's some small European country, so their per capita GDP is much higher, right? But given the size of uh, of our population, so that's that's extraordinary. Okay, so anyway, so those define as a high income, and then the lighter the color is defined as low income. So look at here, what does low income means? Low income, one thousand four hundred uh, fifty dollars or less. What that means? That just means per day, they have less than $3 to spend. Just imagine if you only have $3 to spend each day, what would be your life look like? Just give you a sense in the United States. So the poverty line is defined roughly 18,000 uh, 18, per year, right? So you can see this extreme poor. But for the people who live under this extreme poverty, it's not a small fraction. It's a big fraction. Okay? So largely, they live in Africa and some part of Asia. All right? So because of the density of the population, okay, and then the total size is very large. It's close to one-third of the world population. For rich country. So largely in North America, United States, Canada, and in Western Europe, and of course, Australia, right? So basically, so there's wide variety of difference, or so there's large difference in terms of income, okay? But then, so we make the, 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 the important question is, What's behind the difference? What explain? So far, what I just show you, like in the previous slides, the importance of growth, right? So it's because of the growth, so we can enjoy your life. So on paper, eight times better than your great grandparents, right? Not only that, so if we look at across country, so you can have a life hundred times better than someone lives in Africa, right? So what is behind that? So that's something we need to understand. Why we got so lucky, right? Okay, so let's just look at some um, math to help you understand or further appreciate the importance of growth. So this is called rule of 70. So this says, if a country grow by some percentage, remember this percentage, and then, so this is the number of years it will take to double your income. If you are wondering how we come up this formula, again, this is coming from calculus. Essentially, what we are trying to do is the following, okay? So we are trying to find out one plus, let's say X percent, N years equal to two, all right? So given X percent, you need to find the N and then roughly from calculus, N roughly equal to 70 divided by X, okay? Okay, so you may want to come to your calculus, yes, question? Okay, so if you really want to know, so let me just quickly do that for you. So again, so what we are trying to do is starting point is one plus X percent raise the power of N equal to two. You understand that, right? Okay, we take log on both sides and then you're gonna N times log one plus X percent equal to two, right? And then N equal to two, equal to two divided by log one plus X, uh, wait a second, sorry, log, log. Okay. And then, so if you just, this approximately, so on this, this things, this things, approximately equal to 70 divided by X. That's how the 70 comes from. Okay. So don't worry. So if you don't get that, don't worry. So this is, this is not mass, this is not a mass class. This is economics. 
right? So this 70 is enough for you. But apparently, so if you have a good calculus background, what you should immediately realize is, so this rule of 70 works the better, the smaller the growth rate, because this is an approximation. All right, okay, just keep that in mind. All right, so what matters to us is, understand this example. If country grow by 3.5%, it's gonna take two decades to double, right? Okay, so what is the morale or what is the inspiration? If we grow by small amount per year and we can consistently doing that for a long period of time, so that's tremendous. As a matter of fact, for the United States, the reason why we have such successful surgery is because, so we can do this small improvement, actually it's much smaller than 3.5. Uh, our is like 2%, but we can do that for a century. Okay, so that's, that's what matters. You just consistent doing this for a super long period of time, right? Now let's look at some practice. So we understand what's, what is the value of this 70, okay? So this one is simple, okay? One country grow by 2%, this roughly refers to the United States. It's gonna take how many years? Seven divided by two, right? So by the way, so let's just go back to the earlier sense. In the United States, like we saw, for the past century, so if we grow by eight times basically, right? So that's roughly coming from these two. How we do that? So because 35 years, you're gonna double. In one century, how many times are you gonna double? I'm sorry? Three, yeah. So three times, you can double three times. So three times, that just means two times two times two, that's equal to eight, right? Now let's go back to the previous slides we saw. United States, that's close to eight, right? So this number. Okay, so that's another example to show you the rule of 70, okay. Now the other one, so this one is slightly in bold compared to the other one. It's not that straightforward. Read the question carefully and then find out what's the number. So I can write down the, the key information on the... Okay, so here are the key informations. India currently 3,000 per year. Italy, 24,000. Okay, so that's a huge difference. Now question ask, how many years for, e, uh, for India to catch up with Italy at the current level? All right, so another information we know is that Indian grow by 5%. So this, to answer this question, we need to do two steps. Step number one, to find out the gap between India and Italy. So in other words, you need to understand, so to grow how much so that Indian to catch up with the current Italy, all right? So that part is simple. So you use 24 divided by 3,000. That equal to eight. All right. So actually, it might be three three steps. Step three. 
So for India, take how many years to double? So rule of 70, right? 70 divided by five equal to 14 years. Now the third step is, so take how many, how many times does India need to double so that the catch up is current Italy? They need to double how many times? Two times two times. Right? So eight coming from here. Right? And why we look at two? Because we knew it take 14 years to double. So that's convenient. So two times two times two equals eight. But then, so take this, this calculate how many years to take. Double once, 14 years. Another 14, another 14. And then take how many years? 14 times. Is that right? Does it make sense? So make sure you understand the calculation, okay? So to summarize this part, here just show you the comparison between different countries. So United States, we are here, 1.7. It looks tiny, but I remember we just consistently doing that for a century, right? And then, so that's translated into dramatic change. To help you to understand that, so as a matter of fact, there are countries like, say, for example, Zimbabwe, not grow, even worse, the economy is collapsing. You may wonder what happened. What do you think? What is the main cause of theirs collapsing? What's your guess? So largely, so in that part of the world, largely because of the internal conflicts, like zero war, right? Okay, so on the far left, you have, you have seen China, okay, 7.6%. And they were able to do that for three decades. What that means? That means a lot. So basically in one decade, with this speed of growth, they can double. In three decades, so basically they achieve what the United States have done in the center, right? But then the question is whether they can sustain such growth, right? So let's skip this. So now we are going to look at kind of open the black box to understand what is behind the successful story what is behind the disaster, right? What expand? There are some country enjoy super rich, what some country is suffering for a long time. But it's certainly before I open this black box, but it's always keep in mind this is a clause of, of economics. So we look through our world, use the uh, perspective of the economics. That's not the definite answer, but just one aspect. So if you go to other clause, say for example, sociology, okay? So they have a slightly different explanation, okay? But we have one particular perspective, all right? So now we are going to try to unlock the source of long run economic growth. But first of all, Long run economic growth is crucially dependent on one thing, which is labor productivity. What is labor productivity? Essentially, it's just measuring by the output per worker, how much a worker can produce. But this worker, so in modern economy, we should not 
only interpreted this as say for example this manufacturing worker okay so this worker you should interpret it as something like a mix agriculture or someone working the farm plus someone working in the manufacturer and then plus someone is doing coding for a big tech company doesn't make sense so this is like a representative worker just represent a, a, a wide spectrum of our economy. But certainly go to different countries. So this, this representation is gonna differ. If you go to Africa, and then these workers probably, is primarily a hard labor farmer. Does it make sense? Or if you go to China, and then, so this worker probably primarily is someone working in the factory. All right, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so but the, the takeaway from this slide is source of growth largely relies on how much a worker can produce, right? But what of relevant to the production? Now I want to remind you something we discussed earlier, right? So there are source or the input that relevant to the output. Anyone remembers, we talked about that in the earlier slide. So there are, let's say output, essentially just determines the production, how much we can produce. And so there are a few inputs, anybody remember? Land, that's one, thank you. What else? Certain these slides we talk about a physical capital, let's call it K, K. What else you think is matters? Human capital, thank you, let's call it H. What else? Labor, okay, thank you so much. And what else? There's a crucial part. What else? Take a knowledge. Right? Okay, now let's see one by one, what are they and why they are important. So we start with physical capital. So what's physical capital? So just human made, like this building. Okay, so the computer, the projector, uh, the furniture. So those are human, there's a human memory, right? Human capital. What is human capital? So that's improvement in the way we work, in the way we organize our workplace, or in the way we produce human capital, right? So essentially the knowledge the skill, right? So that is explain why a college graduates usually, usually makes more than a million more over lifetime compared to a high school, um, compared with someone, compared with someone who only has high school diploma. Does that make sense? Okay, that's human capital. Technological progress. That's an advancement in how we produce, right? There are plenty of examples. So currently, so this, uh, this uh, technology we are using like internet, like Zoom, right? So it makes remote collaboration possible, right? So that saves lots of time in terms of traveling and also save a lot of time in terms of coordinating, right? Okay, so this technology progress. But certainly in old days, Carnegie Mellon, does everyone know this guy? So back in 1900, so he's considered the king of the steel uh, refinement, right? So he make a fortune, he becomes, a, uh, he used today's standards, it's probably like a, uh, a trillionaire kind of, right? So he has a new way to refine 
the iron and the steel, right? So back then, that was a great innovation. And the modern days, like where we are now, so you can know Google, right? So invent many things, change how we live, right? Okay, so those are examples. Okay. So once we understand those factors, matters to what we produce, we are going to write down kind of a theory or a model or a mathematical formula to what? To math input to output. And, and this is called aggregate production function. And this aggregate production function will give you the answer to the economic growth difference. Right, but first, what is aggregate production function? So this is essentially a function that shows how productivity, which is measured by real GDP per worker, depends on the quantity of the things we just talked about, right? So including physical capital, human capital, labor, technology, okay, land, so it, land usually we just characterize as part of capital or land becomes less important compared to, compared with um, the, compared with the word by or to the industrial revolution, right? So now here, let's show you how the production function looks like. So on the Lebanon side is the productivity. On the right hand side are inputs. What are the inputs? Physical capital, human capital, technology, right? But certainly, there's labor. But it remembers everything is like per worker. So that just means we have been normalized. All right? Because everything is per worker turn. So we just normalize the labor. All right? So summarize this equation tells you what it determines productivity. All right? And then there are two terms here, or two numbers, 0 0.4 and 0 0.6. Essential, these two number will measure the importance of each factor, okay? This measuring the importance of each factor in contributing this productivity. Larger the number here or here, higher the number means bigger contribution. Right? Other things you want to you want to pay attention is let me erase, highlight, write down. So these two numbers. One larger, more important. Two, 0 0.4 plus 0 0.6 equal to one. Okay, so the equal to one actually reflects what we call a constant return to scale. This is something you will study in more details in a more advanced class. But quickly, what this means is so for a factory, for a firm, you proportionally double their size or triple their size in terms of physical capital, human capital. And then, so the output is going to proportionally increase by the same practice. There's no gain by 
making a firm bigger. So this is what these constant return scope means, right? Okay, so the other things, uh, sorry, these, the other things I want to emphasize, this is what we're gonna extensively discuss in the following slides, is that this functional form on the right-hand side has a interesting property. So what is that? So the more physical capital you have, if you have more physical capital, okay, then marginally, each additional physical capital, additional physical capital will give you less productivity gain. Okay, so let me repeat. So in this production function, the more physical capital you have, and then marginally each additional capital will bring you less and less productivity gain. And how we understand that? Just intuitively say, for example, so when you first got your smartphone, you can try quite tremendously from that cell phone, right? Now, if just imagine if you got a second cell phone, will that help you a lot? No, at least compared to the first one, the gain is very small. Now, if you have the third one, and the gain is even smaller, right? So this is a, this is the contribution of physical capital becomes smaller once you have more and a more physical capital. All right. This is important as we to understand, so the catch up. Okay. So now the other things we can learn from this formula is that is that, so some country has more physical capital and then usually their productivity is higher. Well, another, another uh, possibility is if some country has more human capital, usually it's measured by educational level, average. And then their productivity is gonna be higher, right? So by the way, so the things I just explained in the previous slides, the last thing that I wrote down is called a diminution return to physical capital. Okay, so here it says each successive increase in the amount of physical capital leads to smaller increase in productivity, right? And here's this successive increase, actually I call it like margin increase, additional margin increase, it's the same thing. Example is the second a computer improve your productivity, but not as much as the first one. Okay, it's diminution return to physical capital. But it play a long, it play a, a very important role to understand some phenomena in economic growth. Okay. So actually this is how the production function looks like. But here, what we did is we just plot productivity against one variable, which is physical capital per worker. Well, certainly the function we saw before is three dimension. Okay, we just fit that uh, other dimension, which is uh, human capital. We just look at how, we only look at how real GDP per worker change with its physical capital. And this, the, there are two things you should notice. Number one, this is the increasing function. The more physical capital you have, the higher productivity. Number two, so this function getting flatter and flatter, meaning the more physical capital you have, you move to this direction, the marginal gain is decreasing. Just consider this is, this is a 
what are you going, what happened you have the first computer? Is what happened you have the second computer? Is what happened you have the third computer? Kind of, right? And then on the vertical lines, again, it's getting smaller and smaller. Okay. But immediately, this just means the richer the country becomes, the slower the growth. How we understand that? So basically, if we compare United States versus significant China, and then so if we use the same production function, and then US probably is going to stand here. China's probably stand here, right? And then for each country, if they save one dollar or they increase their investment by one unit, and then so China is going to have a, a advantage because of the lower top of the stock. So they're going to gain more than what the US can do, right? So that's expense. So why richer you get, the slower you grow, okay? So this is another way to interpret it is the first paragraph. Additional amount of physical capital are less productive if we keep everything else constant. But in reality, but in reality, so it seems maybe different. So in the sense, in a sense, so you may simultaneously you have better technology or you have better human capital. The difference is not only in physical capital, it may also happen in other dimensions. So what do we just expand in these slides here, which is a fix in other dimension. But in reality is that, so they also different in other dimensions. Yeah. Let's keep that in mind. All right. Okay. So how we understand that, so in terms of other dimension, it means it could be the case. So US, this is probably here. US is going to move from B to D. Okay, some African country is probably just going to move from here to here. Does it make sense? Okay, so even though so like a per like a purely look at the physical capital, so the gain is very large. Right, if it just if nothing else changes, and then again, so like United States probably does again for physical capital, but because at the same time, so U.S. is going to have, is going to is going to enjoy technology progress, and then so they're going to move from B to D. Right, so there's like simultaneously there's an increase in physical capital, there's an increase in physical capital, and other dimension, right? Okay. Now with this, now with this, we can understand gross accounting. So what we are trying to do here is to understand what caused the growth. Okay. So there are three different things matters, right? So it could be change in physical capital, could be human capital. And finally, it could be, it could be increase in labor. And then this gross accounting, it just, it just do a decomposition. So for example, United States, so we grow by 2% uh, per year. Okay, and this gross accounting just says, okay, so we are gonna do a county exercise to attribute these two percent to different factors we we can observe right and then this with with this gross as counting so we have total factor productivity okay so that's essentially that's essentially just tells us what is the output for given amount of factor input 
but what affect the input? So those are things we just look at here. Okay, so just, or in other words, so TFB, this, this T, total factor productivity, short for TFP. Okay, this TFB is just measuring for given physical capital, human capital and labor, how much we can produce, right? So in some sense, so this TFB is measuring the level of technology, right? So this is a gross accounting. From this uh, gross accounting, the main things we learn is that technological, technological progress or technological improvement is essential and crucial to economic growth and particularly over the long term. In the short run, so you may be able to achieve high growth by save more, okay? But over the long term, it must crucially come in from sustainable technology progress. Okay, so this is gross accounting. Now, the last question is about the natural resource and the sustainability of our growth. So the modern economy, so we rely on some natural resource, a second of oil, right? So that's essentially considered the broad of modern economy, right? So, so what about the role of natural resource? Okay. As a matter of fact, once we move to more advanced stage of our economic growth, the human capital and the physical capital becomes more and more important than natural resource, okay? It's because we kind of find some renewable or alternative resource, or we can, we, we know how to use a resource more efficiently. So the natural resource becomes less important than in the old days, okay? Right, so here, just show you, this is like case study, right? So Robert Gordon, he's a famous economist and he has identified five big innovations in modern human society. So that contributes to the sustainable growth we observe during the past century. So this include electricity. So this probably happens at the beginning of about 20th century. In, uh, internal combustion engine, this happens in 19th century and the 20th century, right? Now there's running water and a central, central heating. So you, if you may take this for granted, but this actually improve the sanitation. That improve the um, life expectancy. That improve the health, okay? So those things translate into dramatic improvement in productivity because worker become healthier and they live longer, All right? The third one is modern chemistry. So again, so that's reduced the mortality rates. Okay. Last one, mass communication, movie, and a telephone. So that's making the long-term collaboration becomes feasible. So those are the five things he identified as big innovations. And that's part of the experience of why we observe this growth in the 20th century for US economy. But then the big question is, are we running out of big idea? That's something everyone was wondering, okay. So this is kind of what he was projecting, right? So like we saw the data from here to here. So there was a rapid increase, right? And that's coming from, those rapid increase coming from the previous slide. Okay, those things, contribute to the rapid increase. Oh, sorry. Okay. But then what happened next? In this particular economist, he's a little bit pessimistic. He was worried we are running out of new and big ideas. Who knows? 
So let's let's see what happens or what what your generation can come up, right? To close this part, okay. So this picture shows you the value of economic growth. Okay, so these two countries, so they used to be also one country. Okay, now they have very divergent divergent experience in terms of growth, right? And so this is very vivid by looking at the night sky, okay? Okay. All right, so now let's look at the, the, the factors can expand gross difference across country, okay? So from where we started so far, so we can identify a few resources, a few uh, source of growth. One is saving. Why this matters? What do you think? Why saving and investment spending can boost up economic growth? To understand that, so let me just write down the input we need for, for productivity. This including capital or physical capital, let's use K, physical capital. What else we need? We talk about human capital, right? What else? Technology. So then, so we can do an exercise. So essentially there are three things we, we need to link them together. So saving is going to improve capital, right? Education is going to improve human capital. Research and development is going to improve technology. So that's the link. Or in other words, you want to improve either one of them. And then you can take either one of them on the left hand side so that you can achieve higher growth. But certainly that also explains why the growth rate differ from one country to the other country. Right. So by the way, here I just show you what are those means. R and D is spend is essentially is a spending to create and implement new technology. Right? But you may wonder, or you may need to think about so how we can how we can encourage the firms to do more R and D. Or what kind of institutions we need to encourage R and D. Right? So maybe just give you like two questions. Do you think the production of property right is essential or not? Yes, but why? If your property right is not protect properly, do you have incentive to innovate? No, you worry about people that's gonna steal your idea, right? So. They just give examples of what the government can do or should do to establish a well protected property rights, right? The other things, um, public higher education, sorry, yeah, yeah, so the public support to higher education, that's another example to encourage R&D, right? Now, here, these slides show you so what explain the difference of growth, right? So we comparing Argentina and uh, China, okay? And from here, so this is very clear. So China is picking up or catching up in terms of what? What is here? Year of schooling, what that matters? Let's go to previous slides, if you don't remember. What matters to one of those? Human capital, right? So clearly China is, is picking up. Not only they have high saving and investment spending, they also have rapid growth in human capital. Let's say them compared to Argentina, right? Right, so and then, so given those discussions, we can see there are a few government policies that will be beneficial to growth. Government subsidies to infrastructure. How that matters?
what's the role of that? Or what's the benefit of that is going to bring to growth? Okay, so let me write down those three things we need, right? K, H, T, right? K is physical capital, human capital, technology. Okay, and then we see a few things. So basically government subsidy to infrastructure is going to help with physical capital. Okay, government subsidy to education is gonna help with human capital. Government subsidy to R&D is gonna help with technology. Maintaining a well-functioning financial system is going to help pretty much everything. Why? So well-functioning financial system so allows you to borrow to invest, right? Funct well-functioning financial system allows you to take loans, student loans to what? To go to college, right? So well-functioning financial systems allow those uh, high-tech company to get angel investment in early stage, right? So to make the new idea to shine eventually, right? So those are government policy can help with economic growth. But certainly here, you can see the other side of the story. If some country don't have those good policies, you're gonna expect it they're gonna be lagging behind, right? And if you said that, so like we discussed earlier, so you need protection of property right, and you also need political stability and a good governance so that people has confidence to invest, to innovate, right? right here's an example of in the importance of infrastructure. So this famous Roman aqueduct. So that was built 2000 years ago and it's still, now it's still working, right? So this introduct or this, uh, um, the, build of this aqueduct actually irrigate that region right for thousands of years and make that part flourishing in history. Right, this is a good example. But certainly that also brings lots of uh, population and economic growth, right? All right, so there are many things we need to discuss for this chapter. So basically I think I covered the, the, the essential part for growth. And then the last part, yeah, so I'm gonna skip those, right? So, and then there are two more things I want to discuss, cause this is kind of, again, this is a more or less kind of overview, okay? Two more things, one thing I'm gonna discuss is uh, convergence. And by the way, what is convergence? So this convergence coming from the diminishing marginal return, we have discussed earlier. And this just says the poor you are, the faster you're gonna grow. The faster you grow, that means what? You're gonna catch it up. Catching up means eventually you're gonna convert in terms of per capita GDP, right? So just remind, just, just, just remember the, the graph I showed you earlier. So we compare in China versus US. So China grows by 8% and US grows by 2%. And then, so the gap is narrowing and eventually they're supposed to, supposed to getting closer enough. So that's what this convergence hypothesis means. Okay. So if we now we look at the actual data, look at actual work. So what we find is the convergence happens among wealthy countries. So what do we have here? So we look at the different countries, the group of countries. Horizontal line is the real GDP back in 1955, right after World War II. Vertical line is the per capita GDP in the following six decades. And the clearly you can see there's a negative correlation. The richer you were back in 1955, let me erase and then see, see this earlier. So clearly the richer you were, the slower you grow, right? And then so clearly, so this is gonna catch you now. Cause those country eventually is going to 
getting closer and closer to the United States. That's literally happening, right? But you may wonder, so what happened to those countries, like Japan in 1955? It's largely because of the destruction of the World War II, right? But also that just, that just, that just uh, explains, so why this may not happen if we look at the world as a whole? So by the way, this is look at pretty much every country. And then, so you don't see much patterns, right? So the poor you war, you can grow fast, you can grow very slow. How we reconcile this one versus this one? The answer lies, the answer lies in the following. So there are three things matter to growth, right? So we said human capital, oh sorry, ki, ki, uh, uh, physical capital, human capital, and technology. Okay? And this convergence hypothesis is largely coming from the facts or the assumption, they only differ in terms of physical capital. But in reality, they not only differ in physical capital, they also differ in human capital and technology. If we look at those group of country, it's reasonable to say they only differ in terms of physical capital. But not the case if you look at a wider variety of country. So that's why so this convergence hypothesis only apply for a group of country who are similar and only different in terms of the physical capital. Like, say, so let me compare Japan versus the United States. Right, in 1955, the main difference is probably only the destruction of capital. Okay, this is this convergence. So I'm kind of running out of time for this lecture. So there's a slide we, we, sh we, sh we should watch, but I will leave that for you to watch. And then the last thing we are gonna discuss the losses we're going to discuss for this slide is called sustainable long run economic growth. Okay. So the reason why we talk about sustainability of growth is because growth usually consume lots of natural resource. At the same time, the growth usually creates damage on the environment. The sustainability is in terms of whether we can find enough natural resource to support the growth. And, this, and, and on, the, on the other hand, so whether we can contain the damage to the environment. So this is called sustainable long-run economic growth. Okay. So there are many important issues here, or there are many important data we need to read. So here I'm gonna show you one. All right, so this is for the US economy. And this is for, let me see, like two, sorry, sorry. I think there are two things I'm supposed to show. No. But this one is only the oil consumption, sorry, the oil price. I, I think that there's another slide to show you the oil consumption. All right. But if you look at oil consumption, what we usually see is, so the oil consumption is increased over time, right? So that's kind of which tells you, so the growth use lots of natural resource, right? And then so people worry about, so the growth is not sustainable because we are going to consume or we are going to exhaust all the natural resource. But if we look at the price, that hopefully bring us some, some hope. In the sense, so the price kind of reflects the supply and demand, right? As a matter of fact, so once we use more and more, the price is gonna reflect, and then the demand can decline, or we can find, because of the price, is gonna send out the signal, so we may find alternative natural resource. So in that sense, so maybe this is sustainable, right? So I'm gonna stop here for this lecture and we're gonna see each other in next class, right? Thank you so much for your attention.